Welcome to the online service of Harborsite Baptist Church, a place of safety, rest, and resupply. We now join the morning service already in progress. This is going to be a very familiar passage of scripture to you because we read through this every time we have communion and we'll be looking at some of these verses again here in just a little bit as at the close of the service as we do um, participate in communion in the Lord's Supper and one of those ordinances that the Lord has uh, given us um, let me ask this question. How many of you know, do you, how many ordinances are there in, of the church, in the church? Or a church ordinance, something that the Lord wants us to do on a regular basis. He's actually given us some commandments about that. And um, does anybody have any idea what, what um, those might be? What one or both of them might be? How many there are? I just told you. How many? Two. Two. Both. All right. What are they? Do you know? What an ordinance. The ordinances of the church are. One is baptism, and the other one is communion, the Lord's Supper. Exactly. We're going to look at that here in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, the Lord's kind of been giving me this, uh, kind of leading me along is... Uh, We've been looking at this theme over the last month of remembering certain things. We were talking about remembering the Lord, uh, his message, uh, the message of the master, remembering the gospel, remembering that hell is for real and so on. And I want us to consider as we, we look at communion, what we should remember when we come together at communion, okay? Uh, it is an ordinance uh, of the church. It's one of those things that we should celebrate uh, regularly. Uh, and I know that there's some question amongst, even amongst good independent fundamental Baptist churches as to when you should do that. Uh, there are other, um, other groups that consider every time you meet, you have communion. Uh, there are traditionally sometimes when you come together at the end of the month or once a month and so forth. I know when uh, the church I first pastored, uh, I inherited a lot of traditional kind of things. And one of those traditional things was that um, every the last Sunday of every month, we had communion. And uh, you would appreciate the fact that because their pastor at that time, myself, is not known for his brevity, you could look that up if you don't know what that means. And then we add communion onto it. Sometimes it was a longer service and so forth. And uh, to be honest with you, it just kind of lost its importance. I know for me, uh, a lot of times there would be folks that wouldn't show up because they knew it was going to be a longer service. And so I started talking to the deacons about, you know, what about maybe making it once a quarter or something like that. And uh, be, believe it or not, we got, we got some pushback. Uh, from some folks, and they were saying, um, well, that's just not biblical. And I said, well, of course, we want to stand true to the to scripture, okay? We don't want to go contrary to what God says, obviously. So tell me this, how often does the Bible say you should have communion? And some folks said once a month. Some folks said once a week, every Sunday. Some folks said, don't know, okay? Uh, well, we're going to look at it here in just a second. Um, and, and it says in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you're not there already, it says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, as often as you do it. So how often is that? It's kind of up to the church, isn't it? Okay. Uh, so we're going to look at that. and. Um, we did end up changing it to the quarter and so on. It became a lot more important, I think, to the church as a whole, certainly to me, uh, because it, it went from just being something that we automatically do uh, to being more meaningful. But what should we remember when we come together at communion? That's what I want us to look at uh, this, this, this morning, and I want to preach a message to you that I have entitled, When This You See... When this you see, remember me. 
Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have now to come together and look at your word. And we praise you and thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to celebrate one of these ordinances, to remember our Savior once again, to contemplate what it means when we come together as a church body to celebrate the Lord's Supper, communion, the Lord's table, whatever we want to call it, Lord, and we, we praise you and thank you for instituting it. We thank you for the testimony that we read in the Gospels of our Savior, really giving that ordinance to the disciples, and it became certainly traditional in the church, but more than traditional. Lord, it, it is a, a testimony. It is a uh, a picture of a reality that we know of uh, as it pictures the death, burial, and resurrection in a matter of speaking of our Lord and the fact that he was sacrificed for us. And we thank you for that. We pray that you would help us to better understand it, uh, to better treasure it in our hearts, and then take also, Lord, the message that is encompassed in it out into a lost and dying world. We ask your blessings upon the children that their time would be profitable. We pray the same for ourselves now in Jesus' name. Amen. So when this you see, remember me. What should we remember when we come together at communion? Well, to begin with, let me just read uh, verses uh, 23 through 26 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Well, what's the first thing, the first principle, the first um, activity, if you want to call it that, we should remember when we come together for communion? Well, we should remember, and he's mentioned this already, his death. Remember his death. Uh, verse 24 again says, this do in remembrance of me. Verse 25 says the same. And then when you do that, Paul says in verse 26, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Now, one of the things I want you to understand about the death of our Savior is that it, it was unique, okay? You say, well, pfft. now wait a minute, preacher. Everybody dies. Well, there's a good possibility that everybody in this room won't die because the Lord could come back before 11 o'clock, which is about 20 minutes from now. Wouldn't that be something? If the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time would be no more and the church would be raised, wouldn't that be something? But if the Lord tarries, we will all die. We will all come to the end of our lives. I want you to hold your fingers in 1 Corinthians 11, and I want you to turn to John chapter 10, because the, the, the death of our Savior, Jesus Christ, is, more, is unique in a, in a matter of speaking, is different, really, than any other death that ever has been. I want you to look at John chapter 10, And notice verse number 11, John 10, verse number 11, Jesus says to his disciples, I am the good shepherd. Now notice the last part of the verse. It says, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Skip down to verse number 15. He says there in verse 14, again, I am the good shepherd. He says in verse 15, as the father knoweth me, even so know I the father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. 
verse 17 says, therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. What does all of that mean? That means that when Jesus died, he didn't die like everybody else that has died since today. And if the Lord tarries, we will die. Okay. What he did was he voluntarily ended his own life in a matter of speaking. Okay. But you've also got to understand verse 17 says that I might take it again. What happened three days after he was crucified? He was raised from the dead. How did he do that? He did that himself. How, why, how is it possible for him to lay down his life the way he did and then take it up again? It's because he of who he is and who is he? He's God, okay? Now, go back to 1 Corinthians 11 and notice, if you will, verse 24 again says, this do in remembrance of me, verse 25, in remembrance of me, okay? That particular word, if you like to underline in your Bible and make notes there, or you want to just write it down, the word remembrance in these verses means to remember specifically. It's a specific word, okay? And the object of it is Christ. It means to remember Christ and his. Now, here's a, here's a strange sounding word. We're going to discuss that here in just a second. His expiatory sacrifice for sin. And you said, what? What is that? Okay. Well, expiation, the word expiate or expiation or expiatory means to make atonement. It serves to put an end to something. It means to extinguish the guilt of and pay the penalty specifically of sin. So when Jesus gave his life voluntarily on the cross, what did he do for our sin? Basically, he extinguished the guilt of it. How many of you have ever been camping? Ever been camping? I don't know, maybe you were, uh, how many of you ever had a, Maybe you'd never been camping before, but you had a, a, a gathering, and a lot of times we do this in the summertime. I'm kind of wondering why we do it in the summertime and not the wintertime more as far as having a bonfire or, a, you, you know, getting the, um, the uh, you know, the, the fire pit out and, and different stuff like that. I wonder why when it's hot already, why do we need a fire? You know, you know how we do, we do that a lot, right? In the wintertime, where are we? We're inside, okay? But if you ever done that, maybe got the fire pit going, and, and what, what often goes with fire pits? Marshmallows, Marshmallows hot, dogs. hot dogs, chocolate, graham crackers, whatever it is, okay? Whatever you happen to roast over uh, the fire there and, and so on, let's just suppose you've gotten your fill of s'mores. You know, how many can you eat? I don't know. I've never filled myself up with them. And uh, now that uh, I'm on a modified Weight Watcher diet, I don't know that I will ever get any. <clears throat> and I'm sure that it, even if they make sugar-free marshmallows, do they? Does anybody know? Don't tell my wife because I don't want them. They make sugar-free marshmallows. They may come creeping into our house sometime, and we'll get them out and so forth. I know they make sugar-free chocolate. They probably make sugar-free um, graham crackers and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, when you're done with that, whether you filled yourself up with hot dogs or s'mores or, or whatever it is you were roasting over the fire, what do you normally do with the fire? What's a good thing to do? What would Smokey the Bear want you to do with the fire? to extinguish it right not just let it burn down to coals okay where there's no flame coming out of it what does he want you to do and I can remember reading that from Smokey himself uh, and uh, you know I was a cub scout at one time and we went through all those kind of things if you're ever camping and you know you want to make sure that 
uh, you, you pour water on it and then you mix it up and then you pour more water on it and then you mix it up a little bit more and then you pour more water on it. So basically what you've done is you made a mud hole out of wherever it was. So why do you want to do that? You want to extinguish that particular put completely out, okay? So there's no longer going to be a threat to anybody. It's not going to start a fire or, or anything like that. Well, guess what? When Jesus died, his expiatory death did what with our sin? It extinguished it. It is no longer going to do any kind of damage whatsoever to me. And when we come together to celebrate communion, we should remember that. It was, again, that wonderful word, expiatory. It extinguished. It means that a coming to an end. Let me hold your finger, have you hold your fingers there in 1 Corinthians 11. I should have had you stay in John because we're going to go back there to John 19. John 19. As far as the, the, the coming of, to the end of our sin and our sin debt in particular, Notice John 19 and verse 28. John 19, 28 says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished. How many have ever accomplished anything? You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. What kind of things do people accomplish? Well, our daughter-in-law has accomplished, she has fulfilled all of the requirements for her master's degree. She has accomplished that. She's going to celebrate that on Wednesday. Uh, you have, uh, those of you that have a uh, high school diploma, you have accomplished the requirements for graduation. And it might be something else, you know, whether it be your job or anything like that. Maybe it is that you've been married a, a particular milestone number of years, Okay. Uh, those are all accomplishments, but I want you to notice here, it says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, in a matter of speaking, finished, I did it, okay? That the scripture might be fulfilled, he saith, I thirst. Now, there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. And now, notice verse 30 says, when Jesus, therefore, therefore had received the vinegar he said to telestai and you go what what is that it's one word in the original language it's three words in our english it means it is finished and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost that particular word is very very strong in the greek language okay and what it means is it is now and forever will be done. Never to be done again. That's the idea. When Jesus said, it is finished, what was he talking about? He was talking about this, the payment for our sin, what was necessary to pay for our sin, and everything that was necessary had been completed, accomplished, finished, never to be done again. And why is that? Why is that important? Well, turn back to John 17. And look at verse number four. This is Jesus' prayer, high, his high priestly prayer in the garden before he was betrayed. He's praying. And he says in verse number four, he says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. He accomplished everything that was his mission, everything that was his ministry as it relates to our salvation. And on the cross, what did he do? He accomplished that work. Why is that important? Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's important because it says, when he says in John, finished, 
The word means to complete anything, not merely end it, but to bring it to perfection. He completed it. It doesn't have to be done again. So be careful when you hear people say, oh, we believe in the gospel. We believe in God. We believe that Jesus died to save us from our sin. We've put our faith in Christ, but we believe that in order to get to heaven, to really have your sins washed away, you have to join the church, be baptized, go on some pilgrimage, give regularly, uh, participate in the, in the Lord's Supper every week. What has that done to the expiatory, the dis extinguishing quality of the death of Jesus Christ in regard to our salvation. If I say Jesus died, was buried, raised from the dead, I believe that, but I also believe in order to get to heaven, I have to be, and a lot of folks in this area believe this, have to be baptized. What does that do? What does that say about the finished work of Christ? says he's not finished. You got to add something to it, okay? Now, we have to also understand this. When Jesus said, it is finished, and I've explained that word to you, did he mean what he said? Did he? Absolutely, he did. And we have to go beyond that. He's not just a good man, right? He's not just a good man that, you know, never told a lie, kind of like George Washington, you know. He's better than that. He was also God. He's also God in the flesh, okay? And we know from Scripture that it is not in God's character. It is impossible for God to lie. Now, when Jesus said, it is finished, what did he do? He told the truth which leads us to understand that as far as the payment for our salvation is concerned, it's done. Our sin has been paid. There's nothing that we have to add to it to make it complete. That's important because he's also the mediator as far as standing between God and man. It's not only something that we, our sin debt, I should say, is extinguished, but the, the word finished again means to complete, not merely end it, but to bring it to perfection. Hold your finger in 1 Corinthians 11 and look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, verse number 3 says, he's speaking of prayers and supplications and intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings in particular. Verse 3 says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Okay. Verse four says, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is, now you might underline this verse as well. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now, what does that word mediator mean? One God, one mediator between God and man. If I remember correctly, do we have, John, you were a shop steward at, during your career, right? Now, were there times when you did mediation kind of work? Okay. Okay. A lot of things. So he's, he, you're, and you, if I rem understand the idea, you, you come representing the, um, the laborers, 
to the management. Is that correct? Okay. 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 Right. Okay. So what John did as a shop steward and in, in his his job there in in regard to that was to make peace between the parties in a matter of speaking. If if the if the company is wrong, then he would go on behalf of the employee and say, "Hey, look here, we have a grievance and so on and so forth." If the employer or the employee was wrong, they needed to understand the company said this and so on. Well, he, he was a mediator. Now, the, a mediator, and it says that there is one God there in, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. It says there's one God and one mediator between God and man. The mediator is one who stands between and unites two parties mediating for peace. That's basically what John just described was his work that he did while he was employed. But that is one of the things that Jesus did at his death, okay? Now, again, hold your fingers in 1 Corinthians 11 and turn to Ephesians chapter 2, okay? Now, I'm going to try and tie this all together real quickly as we remember the death of our Savior. Why was it important? Well, because it was an expiatory sacrifice. It extinguished our sin. It put to rest the penalty and the payment of our sin because he is a mediator he stands between and unites two parties notice ephesians chapter 2 verse 13 says but now in christ and he's speaking to when we were unsaved outside the the church outside salvation okay in Christ, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh. When we bring somebody nigh, okay, we don't tell kids. We don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't anticipate unless I remember this message when our grandchildren arrive, grandchild arrives, okay. I probably will not say to this little human, come nigh, okay. I probably won't do that, okay, because they'll look at me and they'll go, Papa, grandpa, gramps, grandfather, whatever, you know, uh, no comprende. I don't know what, what you just say. I don't, I didn't get that, man. Okay. But what, what am I going to say? Come here, come here. Okay. And you know how kids will look at you, you know, when you say, Hey, don't go over there, come here. They'll look at you like, what, what are you talking about? I want to go over here. I want to go over here and play in the traffic. No, you come here. Come here. Don't make me track you down, right? They might, they might learn very quickly that grandpa don't run, okay? I remember David, when he was small, I said, David, I said, you get over here right now. And he said, Dad, you couldn't catch me. Don't you be too sure, okay? Don't you put, be too sure. But when we say come here, we're talking about the child or the person or whatever coming near to us, okay? And so notice, if you will, again, we are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For Now notice this, for he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us and have, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, okay, that bad, hard relationship, okay, even the law of com commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man making peace. What is he saying? He might reconcile both unto God and so on there, okay, what is he saying? What did Jesus become when he died on the cross, his 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 death on the cross was expiatory. It extinguished the debt, extinguished the penalty of our sin. And because he did that, he now stands, he can now stand between us and God and work things out. That's the idea. 
of mediation. And we also have to understand something as far as this kind of mediation is concerned, okay? A mediator could make either party obligated to himself because he had the authority to do that. Now answer this question. Who has the authority to make God obligated to do anything? No, that's not true. Jesus is the only one that can do that. I can't do that. I can't say, hey, Lord, I'm praying. I really am. Okay. When this little boy comes into the world in November, did you see the obligation? Because we don't know if it's going to be a little boy or not, right? We don't know if it's going to be a little girl or not. We don't know if it's only going to be one or not because there's twins on her side and there's some twins in my past as my family is concerned. So, um, but I can't make God obligated to me, can I? No, but there's one person that can. And what did he do? When he went to the cross, he made peace with us and God. It's a very important principle for us to understand. And all of that is connected. All of that is part of when we remember his death till he come. All of that. Now, let's go on. We should not only remember his death, we should also remember his definite return. Notice verse 26 again. He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show, show the Lord's death. What are the last three words? Verse 26 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. What does it say? It says, till he come, okay? Till he come. Now, what, is, what does that mean? Well, to begin with, he says there, you show the Lord's death till he come. Underline the word show. Uh, we show his death. And that, that means to declare the good news of a Savior crucified, buried, and raised from the dead. That's the gospel. Well, I'll not take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but that's what Paul says. Remember these things, right? Jesus Christ died, was buried, and raised again from the dead. The third day, according to, as Paul says, his gospel. But the idea of showing his death, how do we do that? Well, the word means to declare plainly. How many of you have ever asked, maybe ever been asked by a grandchild, since we're talking about grandchildren, hoping to have an announcement. Well, we will have an announcement one way or the other. Come this time next week, I'm sure, okay? Um, you've ever showed, you know, little Johnny, little Susie comes up to you, climbs up in your lap and says, Mamma, Papa, whatever they call you, can you show me how to, whatever it is? How many have ever had one do that? Or anybody do that? Now, what do you want them to do? You, you, want to, you want to teach them, but in order to show them what that, what that is, how to do, you know, how to read, whatever it is that they're trying to find out, you, you need to explain it, right? So how do you explain it? How do you explain it to somebody who is much younger than you are and is not as experienced as you are? How do you do that? How do you bring it down on their level? That's what you have to do. You have to declare plainly, openly, and out loud, okay? That's the idea of showing, as he says there, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Now, what does that exactly mean? It means just what it says. You explain or declare plainly. 
can you plainly explain why Jesus died on the cross? Can you do that? Because if you can't, you're going to have a hard time showing the Lord's death till he come. Now, number no, another thing I want you to consider is this also, okay? Do you openly do that? You say, well, yeah, I live a good life. I live, you know, like a Christian should. Okay, great. That's fine. People can see that. People may or may not understand it. But do you out loud do that? Do you show, explain openly and out loud when the opportunity comes why Jesus died? That's the idea. And why is it important? Because there's some outside the church that don't know why he came and why he died. They've heard the story, okay? You know, Easter, everybody celebrates Easter, right? And it's not just, you know, when Peter Cottontail comes hippity hopping in down the bunny trail, right? It's because we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which implies he died before he was resurrected, right? So can you do that? Because when we come together, and we're going to be doing that here in just a few minutes, when we celebrate this event, we do so to remember not only why he died, but also we need to remember our duty, which is to show it openly, out loud, when God gives us opportunity. My question to you is this, are you doing that? Are you doing that? We should be doing that. It's our responsibility. Lastly, we should not only remember his death, our duty, but we should also remember his definite return. What does it mean to be definite? I definitely believe whatever it is. What does that mean? When you definitely believe something, what does that mean? No doubt. I got no doubt in my mind, okay? Um, regardless of what it is, and you have some experience to back it up, hopefully, right? This is definitely the best, and you fill in the blank. This is the best vehicle. This is the best, you name it. You need to have some experience to back that up with. But his definite return, Jesus is coming again. Notice verse number 26 again. He says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death. You proclaim it openly, hopefully out loud, okay? Till he come. Of all of the events that preclude the coming of the Lord, there's really nothing that has to be accomplished. As I mentioned to you, we're already past 11. So Jesus did not come today at 11 o'clock in the morning. We're already past that. But he could come before 1130. Definitely possible. Okay. I want you to look at Acts chapter 1. Hold your finger there in 1 Corinthians 11 and go to Acts chapter 1. This is 40 days after he was raised from the dead, 10 days before Pentecost. Jesus was ascended up to heaven. And it says in verse number nine of Acts chapter one, and when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up. Now, how cool would that have been? To see him. Just keep going so he's out of sight. How cool would that have been? That would have been amazing. He was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. These two men in white apparel, what were they? 
angels, okay? Which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? What are you, what are you looking up there for? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. It's going to happen. Definitely. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul wrote one of the, his first letters. Chronologically, it's not the first letter that he, we find in the, in the New Testament, but 1 Thessalonians was the first letter that Paul ever wrote. He spent about three weeks in Thessalonica, and this church was planted. 1 Thessalonians, every chapter of 1 Thessalonians mentions the coming of the Lord. It's going to happen. And when we remember his death, we have to remember this. He is not dead today. He is alive. He is in heaven. He's even now making intercession for us. But one of these days, what's going to happen very definitely? He's coming again. And my question to you is this, just like showing, proclaiming, openly and aloud, declaring these truths of his death, are you also doing the same thing about his return? Because a lot of people say, when you talk to them about their salvation, they say, well, you know, I'm pretty young. Okay, the older I get, let me ask this question. Of those of you that are older than I am, okay, I will be 59 on my birthday. You remember when my birthday is? The 28th of May? The 28th of July. My in-laws should know that. <laughs> but just so y'all know, 728-62, this coming July 28th, I'll be 59. Okay, so what I want to know is, from those of you that are older than I am, including you, Brother Tim, okay? He, he's got me by a few months, right? Mm -hmm. November to July, however far that is, okay? Uh, I, I think Kevin's got me by a few months, just barely, right? Okay? And I know, we know Shyla's got me by a few months too, so uh, she's not here. So anyway, um, from those of you that are older than I am, how old do you have to get before you realize when you're standing in line wherever getting uh, some food and so forth, or the, you, you know, you're, you're going through the drive through how old do you have to be to remember that you are a senior citizen? Okay. When you turn 62. Okay. Well, some places start at like 55. Okay. I don't know. Is that going to eventually, is that going to be 50 years old? You're a senior citizen at 50. I don't know. Okay, but I do know that when sometimes when we're standing in line, well, we haven't done it in a while because it's not on the Weight Watchers diet. <laughs> in Taco Bell, my wife, you know, I'm just up there chatting, you know, with them and ordering and whatnot. And, and my wife will say, he's a senior citizen. <laughs> I'm going to slap her across the dining room. You know, it's like, what? I don't feel that old. Right, I, I I I've heard this, seen this commercial. It's actually a um, it's like a protein drink commercial. Um, Ensure, I think it is, or Boost, or something like that. This lady says, um, "My, how does she say it? Um, my age is just a number. My age is just a number, and it's unlisted." Okay, all right, I got you, I understand that. But how old do you have to be before you recognize and realize and remember, oh yeah, I'm a senior citizen. It makes me feel old, right? And people will say, well, you are, all right? You're getting old. What's that got to do with anything? What that has to do with that is this. Regardless of how long I live, every opportunity that I have 
I should be remembering not only the death of my Savior, but his return. And it could be, yeah, it could be between, between now and my 59th birthday. It could be after my death. But that doesn't change the fact that he is definitely coming again, does it? And regardless of how long you live, we have to remember these things. We have a duty. We have something to tell to the nations, as the gospel or the songwriter said. What is it? It's that wonderful message. You know, another gospel writer said, wonderful message we bring. What is it? It's the gospel. The fact that Jesus died, he was buried, raised again from the dead. That is pictured in the ordinance, the other ordinance of the church called baptism. But when we talk about his death, when we talk about communion, when this you see, remember me. Remember his death, which was, there's a new word, expiatory. It extinguished the guilt of our sin. Our duty is to show forth, to declare plainly, openly, and aloud that he died for us, he was buried, and he is resurrected, and one of these days he is coming again. We should remember these wonderful truths when we remember the death of our Savior. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to look into your word and we praise you and thank you as well, Lord, for the wonderful message that you have given us, the wonderful love that you displayed on Calvary, the wonderful truth that Jesus laid down his life, but three days later took it up again. That stone which closed the tomb in which his body was laid is open, not to let him out, but to prove, as a favorite song of ours says, to remove any doubt that Jesus is alive. And we praise you and thank you for that. It is one of the, it is probably the most exciting thing that we could ever tell anybody. And as we remember this day, his death. May we realize what it means. May we realize what it covers. May we realize why it was important and necessary. And why we, may we also understand that because of the death of our Savior, we can have peace with a holy God. He died to be the mediator, to stand between God and men and to make peace. And we praise you and thank you for that. We pray that you would just work in our midst now, the invitation time we pray in Jesus' name with heads bowed.